This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. It's often said that elections have consequences. In this case, the Georgia Senate race last month could make all the difference for Representative Deb Holland's confirmation process. President Joe Biden nominated Holland to lead the Department of the Interior. That agency has implemented the relationship between tribes and the federal government since the transfer of Indian Affairs from the Department of War in 1849. Holland is Laguna and Jemez Pueblo. Montana Senator Steve Daines, a Republican, said he would block Holland's confirmation by the U.S. Senate because of her radical views about energy development. It's not clear, though, that Republicans can block Holland's nomination. Even if all 50 Republicans vote no, Democrats can sent consent to her appointment with a tie-breaking vote from Vice President Kamala Harris. One reason for Republican opposition to Holland is a difference of opinion on the Keystone XL pipeline. Danes and other Republicans see this as a major jobs project, while the Biden administration views the project through the lens of climate change. Most of the tribes say ending the Keystone XL pipeline is only a first step and that the administration should review other major projects, including the Dakota Access Pipeline and the mines surrounding Oak Flats. TC Energy has not decided if it will continue to fight for its pipeline project or wait for four more years until there is a new administration. Harold Frazier, chairman of the Cheyenne River Tribe, has praised the pipeline decision, saying, it is rare that a promise to our people is kept by the United States. No date has been set for Holland's confirmation hearings. The Senate will also vote this week on Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. She had bipartisan support from the Senate's Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the same body that will first consider Highland's nomination. That committee is chaired by West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin. An Indian Health Service hospital in western New Mexico will continue to provide emergency and other key services through at least the end of February. A federal judge granted a temporary restraining order to Acoma Pueblo late last month that expires February 28th according to court documents. The order is the latest legal move in an ongoing fight to keep the federally funded Acoma Canyoncito Laguna Service Unit running at full capacity. The Pueblo of about 3,000 people sued the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services over its cut, over cuts to hospital services. The Navajo Nation Council last week purchased a building in Washington, D.C., joining a handful of federally recognized tribes with offices in the nation's capital. The Navajo Nation Council approved the $4.8 million purchase at the end of January. The property includes a 161-year-old home along with a detached building located at 11 D Street Southeast, directly behind the U.S. House of Representatives building. The Biden administration continues to make key appointments to the government. Last week, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency announced that Joanne Chase, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation will be the director of the American Indian Environmental Office, Office of International and Tribal Affairs. Chase is no stranger to the EPA or to the nation's capital. She was the executive director of the National Congress of American Indians from 1994 to 2000, and in 2010 served as senior advisor to the administrator of the EPA for Native American Affairs. Prior to being tapped for this job, Chase was one of three women who launched Sister Smart Org. The project works with young women of color to grow opportunities in science, math, art, technology, and robotics, and to close the gender gap in science and technology. The Cherokee Nation is giving out heirloom seeds to tribal citizens who want to grow traditional Cherokee crops. In 2020, the Cherokee Nation distributed more than 5,000 packages of seeds to tribal citizens. This week, a limited supply of the seeds will be handed out. Cherokee citizens can get heirloom seeds to grow Cherokee White Eagle corn, Trail of Tears beans, Georgia candy roaster squash, a variety of gourds, and Indian corn beads. Seeds for native plants such as the Rattlesnake Master, Wild Senna, and Possum Grape will also be available. There are limits. Each citizen can receive two varieties of seeds, and each applicant must confirm their citizenship via the website or submit a copy of his or her Cherokee Tribal Citizenship Card, Proof of Age, and Address. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahan. When we come back, 
from the Navajo Nation to Mars, a conversation with Aaron Yazzie. Aaron Yazzie knows a thing or two about outer space. He's a mechanical engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He designs mechanical systems for NASA's robotic space research mission with a focus on planetary sample acquisition and handling. His most extensive contributions are for missions to the planet Mars. Yazzie served as Surface Operations Downlink, Downlink Chair for the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover after landing in 2012. He delivered flight hardware to Mars on board the InSight lander mission in 2018. His next set of flight hardware is aboard the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Yazi was the lead engineer for the rover's drill bits that will be used to search for ancient microbial life on Mars. He's from a small community bordering the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona. He's passionate about STEM outreach to students of all ages, especially those from indigenous communities. Welcome today, Aaron Yazi. Thank you, good morning. You said in previous interviews that Mars and Earth were alike. Uh, what do you think, what, why do you think that? Yeah, uh, Mars is one of Earth's closest co uh, cousins, relatives. Um, they're both rocky planets, we call them terrestrial planets. And what that basically means is that the internal makeup of both the planets are very similar um, in the way that they developed over billions of years. So that means that they have a core, a mantle, a crust, and the way that uh, landforms um, and the, the surface of Mars was shaped is basically the same forces that shaped the way that Earth looks. So they have uh, Mars quakes, just like we have earthquakes. They once had large bodies of water, which would carve out little canyons and arroyos. Um, like I said, they had lakes too. So um, all of these things are what shapes why the things that the landforms that we have on Earth, but it's the same story for Mars. So when we study Mars and its history and its geology, um, we're actually learning a lot about our own planet as well. One thing I've been intrigued by lately is the idea of Mars time and how um, how that really complicates your work on Earth. Right. Mars time is interesting. Um, so Mars, Mars has a day that is just barely longer than Earth. It's 40 minutes longer than Earth's day. Um, and so the rover operates on a Mars day um, because it likes to work and operate when the sun is up, um, just like we do. So that way it can have a full view of the area around it with its cameras um, and it likes to sleep at nighttime. Um, and so during the first, uh, I believe it's 90 days, the first critical days of the mission, there are a group of people that work on the operations of the rover who will switch their work schedules to be the Mars time schedule, which means that every day their, their day shifts by 40 minutes by 40 minutes. Um, and after a while, it can get kind of wacky. You can be coming into work two in the morning. <laughs> Well, it almost be like starting off your day in Pacific time and then the next day mountain time, then the next day central time. <laughs> yeah, it would be a lot. D describe what it felt to see your craft land on Mars. Oh man, so the, the first time I got to see um, something that I worked on and built land on Mars was with the InSight mission. Um, InSight um, went up in 2018 um, and I built what's called a pressure inlet for that um, for that mission. Um, and it basically is an instrument that helps to measure very accurately Mars's atmospheric pressure. And that helps inform um, the science instruments that are on board um, to understand what's going on around the, the, the weather and the conditions that are happening around the lander while it's taking very sensitive um, scientific data. Um, and so, yeah, the, I, I got to be in a giant room full of a bunch of engineers with their families that worked on the mission. Um, and and whenever we send something to Mars and it's landing on Mars, it's it's actually still very risky, even though in recent years we've been very successful. Um, 
it's the it's one of the 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 most stressful parts of the mission entry descent and landing um and the reasons why is because marge's atmosphere is so thin um and so it makes landing something slowing something down from from traveling through space at twelve thousand miles per hour to to halting to zero and landing safely on the surface of Mars is a very challenging thing to do. Um, and so th there's a whole sequence set up that happens automatically. And our team that comes up with these entry, descent, and landing sequences um, and, and tests out that whole system um, are really on, on the pressures on them because we're all sitting there with them as uh this everything is happening real time and at every single um victory they announce oh the the parachute has deployed and everybody cheers in the room and oh no, the rockets have powered on and everybody cheers in the room um and it's still very tense and then it finally touches down and they 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 proclaim that it has touched down and they got a signal which means it's alive and then even um for for insight we were lucky enough to get a picture very soon after and we saw that picture appear on the screen and everybody um was was cheering and, and i was cheering and um it was really emotional for me you know it's so interesting because things like that we think of of just being for mars but they really have applications on earth as well you think about the ability to slow down and as we get into uh, electric travel how we're going to have to change the way we think about even ordinary transportation and what you're learning could actually have applications that matter to us right now that's right there's and there's tons of um things that come out of nasa technology which is made for a specific mission to a planet for some purpose that ends up having a dual purpose on earth um and so we we come across those all the time and and that's what that's what makes this job also rewarding is that i can give back to humanity by learning this knowledge, learning about our history and giving that back to us, but also that the technology that is learned from it can also be used here on Earth. Well, what are some of the big ways that humans are gaining from Mars right now? Um, let's see. Well, so there's always the uh, the future travel to, uh, to other planets is um, a big thing right now, um, just the way that we explore them. Um, and so with the 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 Perseverance rover, we're actually learning how to land heavier things on Mars, um, which is sort of paving the way for humans to eventually get to start to explore Mars. Um, and so in order for us to be able to send lots of supply missions there and send humans there, it'll take a, a lot of weight. Um, and so we need to be able to land it safely there. Let me check uh, this kind of back to our audience. Uh, what kind of things do young people need to be thinking about if they want to work in the space program or eventually on Mars? Uh, that's a great question. I think I think there are a lot of um, students and kids um, in Indian country that are interested in the STEM field, that are interested in um, in space, engineering, science, um, all of this Mars exploration. Um, it's something that I wasn't exposed to very much when I was a when I was a kid, um, I didn't, we didn't, we didn't have the internet growing up. So I didn't, uh, the only thing that was fed to me was maybe sometimes something popped on the news, but I didn't know anybody that uh, I had seen go through that process and become an engineer like this. Um, so I didn't, I, I, I kind of excluded myself from this whole field. I didn't think that there was something that I could do or that it was open to me. Um, and so going through school and, and getting, going to different summer programs, getting different internships really helped to just like um, uh, clear my decision and clear the, the future for me to show me that uh, NASA is actually a possibility for me. Um, and so I'm hoping that children now, if they are interested in this, if they are a creative kid, if they like to explore, if they like to build things, um, if they like math and science, even if they like art, if they like, um, it doesn't matter what you're interested in. Um, I'm hoping that you can see yourself at a place like NASA, that this place isn't excluded to you. Um, uh, it, and it, it helps, I hope, to see someone like me um, here doing the job, coming from a place that is similar to that, to where they came from. And so I'm hoping that they don't exclude big parts of their dreams um, without trying first. When did it first hit you? When did you think, wow, this is something I could be doing? 
Um, I, so I had, like I said, I had started doing summer programs. So I would do the Upward Bound program. Um, I did the College Horizons program. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I actually did a program, a summer program for high school students run by NASA. And I went to uh, the University of Michigan and I got to work with a graduate student there on a project that dealt with the field of engineering that I was interested in. And so I just arbitrarily chose mechanical engineering because I didn't really know at the time the big difference between all the different engineerings. And so when I chose mechanical, I actually got really into I, I learned that it wasn't too different from stuff that I already like to do. I loved to draw. I love to design things and invent things. Um, and that's sort of what mechanical engineering is. It's designing, inventing things, and then building them and bringing them to life, um, doing experiments, doing tests, um, all of that kind of stuff. And so after that program, I decided for sure I wanted to go into mechanical engineering. I started um, school. Uh, I went to Stanford University, um, which was a big step for someone from my small hometown. Um, and, and luckily, I was heavily involved in the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, which, which is called ACES. Um, all throughout high school and then it carried me into college. So I got a scholarship from them when I attended college, but I also applied to their, sum their summer internship program um, for two years. And for both years that I got accepted, I got placed at NASA Center. So I worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and NASA Glenn Research Center um, for two summers. Um, and those just really gave me the experience of what it's like to work there showed me that yes, it's stuff that I'm interested in, and two and three, that it's something that I actually can do. Like this is not something that's so far above me that I would never make it there. It, I, I learned that I liked it and that I wanted to try to work at NASA. And so it wasn't until my senior year when I'm looking for, um, for places to work uh, that I met the recruiter for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the national conference for ACES. Um, and gave them my resume and they they flew me down for an interview and um after that i was offered a job well we'll leave it there thank you so much aaron yazi thank you so much and we'll be right back Rhonda Lavalda is joining us from the road where she's been traveling across the country in regard to, the, to protesting the Kansas City football team. Uh, welcome, Rhonda. Hello, how are you doing? So tell us what's been going on. Um, so uh, a group of us um, representing the Not In Our Honor Coalition out of Kansas City in uh, Kansas decided to travel down to the Super Bowl in Tampa to be represented um, at the protest that was organized by the um, Florida Indigenous group down there, and um, just you know, just make sure our voices were heard. This is such an unusual uh, time with the pandemic. What, what was the reception in Florida? Um, you know, it. I guess they were a little bit more lax where we were coming from, from uh, Kansas and Kansas City. Uh, but I guess they had a mask mandate for that weekend which uh, for the most part, most people were abiding to, but uh, there were still some people that weren't wearing masks. But um, I think, you know, being with the Super Bowl, um, a lot of people go there to party. And so um, we were met with some opposition uh, to what we were doing, but for the most part, a lot of the Tampa Bay fans agreed with what we were doing. Kansas City is really kind of fighting history as well as day-to-day uh, -to -day stuff. Um, they're trying to do middle ground. Is any of that working? They have a very small working group they work with, the, uh, their Native American Advisory Committee. And for the most part, uh, they don't disclose really too much what they talk about. And I know a local... Uh, public radio station tried to get in touch with them to do interviews for uh, their pieces that were coming up prior to the Super Bowl, and they could not get any comment from them. And so, you know, for the most part, we don't know 
what they talk about or, you know, what they put forward. Uh, Kansas City has never come and asked us for help or any input at all. And so, you know, we're, everyone's kind of left in the dark of what they discuss. I'm, I'm curious what kind of help you'd offer them. I mean, let's do it right now on national television. <laughs> well, when we first started, you know, we wanted to, in 2005, we asked that they um, get rid of the, the face paint, the headdresses, um, the chop, everything associated with Native American imagery and which they said no. Uh, since then, you know, we haven't had any, um, they haven't responded to anything that we have put forward. At this point, we, we just want everything done away with. We want the name dropped. We want to change the name. Uh, we want everything gone. You know, I'm really struck by the duplicity of the NFL on one sense all weekend they were running ads about their new commitment to civil rights and how justice is something that's really important to the league and yet they continue to allow this sort of um, nonsense to occur. Yeah, it was really a tone deaf statement by the NFL saying they were uh, putting this money into ending systemic racism. And, you know, they have end racism with this group that, you know, perpetuates these Native American stereotypes. They played the tomahawk chop right when they were coming in and people could hear that. And how are you supposed to be um, trying to promote ending racism when you're promoting that type of racism for everybody here, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. Speaking of all over the world, how do fans in Kansas City uh, react to this? Are they coming around to the bigger picture? Or are they still in in strategy? I think there's, there's a lot of mixed reception. We do have a lot of people within Kansas City who support what we're doing. Uh, there's some devout fans that don't want to give it up and and they they are you know true fans of the of being a chief apparently so they don't want to give that up but we do have a lot of good allies within Kansas City that are willing to try and help us out and hopefully moving forward um, this will gain more momentum I think uh, us being down here and and having this protest really um, made our voices heard. And so, especially with the group we were with, like they were very vocal as well. And, you know, we got a lot of uh, press attention um, because of what we were doing. And so hopefully, you know, this is gonna be a, a push uh, for Kansas City to think about what they're doing. Well, in fact, that press attention is remarkable because really, Anytime there's any prominent game, it is now a story every single time. And it really shows that it's not an issue that the Kansas City organization can ignore. And, and if you notice, like every article um, has, every group has always tried to reach out to ask them about this and they don't give any comment. Um, they say, oh, we're working with our, with our group, but that's it. And so, um, you know, they need to, they need to say more. Why, a year ago, would you have thought that Washington would have been ahead of Kansas City on this? You know, that was a, a good surprise. It was a nice surprise. Um, although we don't know what the name's going to be. Hopefully it's it's not something, again, like that. Um, but no, I, I, I was surprised. And I'm glad, though, uh, with Washington, with Cleveland, I feel now uh, the spotlight's on Kansas City to say, hey, you guys need to do something um, and you need to make some right decisions. You know, I don't think, and we've reported on this at Indian Country Today, but I think not many people know that even the history of the Kansas City organization has nothing to do with Native Americans. It really was a fluke that it was named that. Yeah, and definitely, I think a lot of people, they try and say it's named after the mayor and it's like, but he also appropriated Native American culture, which continues on today with that Boy Scout troop, the Mikase. They continue to do that. I've actually had uh, people who are part of that organization who want to take it down. Um, and then I have people that say, you know, they're doing it to honor us. And so it's funny how you have people who are coming to see the light that what they were doing was wrong. One last question, Rhonda, and then we'll let you go. I know you're on the road. Um, does it help when they lose? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, 
it helps, you know, see what they're doing and um, it may not be right. Um, you know, I, I, I have friends that are fans and, and I did tell them I was sorry that their team lost, but um, you know, it does help a little bit. And when we were there last night, um, I had on my one of my tweets that uh, we ended praying before the game started. We ended our demonstration praying. And then we had um, the group, they sang the AIM song right before the national anthem started. And so, you know, I have to think that all the people who have fought this fight before us were there and the indigenous people that used to occupy Florida were there as well. Um, it was a really great moment. I felt like uh, coming together and I'm really grateful that um, everybody who supported us uh, there, um, it, it just felt really great to have that um, moment um, for us and, and you know, just know what we were doing was right. Rhonda Lavaldo, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world today. We'll be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Thank you for joining us. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.